everything everything please if you can mute only yes, sir I am Dr. Abbas from Medical Services of Sun Pharma. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all for today's webinar on topic when child with asthma does not respond. Sun Pharma is always on forefront in providing the platform with expert, providing the platform with expert, which in turn improves quality of patient care. Today's webinar is one of the such events. Today we have with us an eminent pediatric pulmonologist, Dr. Ankit Parat. Dr. Ankit is a senior consultant, pediatric pulmonology, allergy and sleep medicine at BLK Super Speciality Hospital, New Delhi. He is a trained pediatric pulmonologist with wide experience. He previously was a faculty at Kalavati Saran Children's Hospital, New Delhi. He has also been trained at Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children, London, St. Mary Hospital, London, and Lady Silento Children's Hospital, Brisbane, Australia. He is master trainer for various pediatric respiratory IAPA modules like asthma training modules and pediatric tuberculosis guideline. Dr. Parak, Parak specializes in management of children with difficulty to treat asthma, respiratory allergies, persistent pneumonia, tuberculosis, cystic fibrosis, and rare lung diseases. He has performed over 1,500 bronchoscopies, including extraction of foreign bodies. His special interests include under five lung function testing, impulse oscillometry, pediatric sleep studies, and interventional pediatric bronchoscopy, endobronchial ultrasound, TBNA, and cryobiopsy, etc. With this, 
I welcome Dr. Parag for this webinar. Over to you, sir. Uh, very good morning. Uh, Dr. Bas, I can't move the screen. Should I yeah. share and again put it on? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, you stop sharing and again you come back. We can see your presentation as well as you, sir. Both of you are there in scene here. The presentation is not moving. It's not moving forward. You click on the presentation and then uh, click the button, sir. Uh, click and click, click the, uh, now it's moving. Okay, Fine. thank you. Perfect. So very good morning to all of you. And uh, thank you all for joining this webinar. And thank you Sun Pharma for organizing this great event. So, Today we'll be talking about a child with asthma who doesn't seem to respond. Now this clinical situation is not rare. So a, a child with parents might just walk into your clinic and into your clinic and saying that, you know, my child is not doing well. Uh, doctor, help me. Help my child. And the child seems to be on all drugs. So the child seems to be on some inhaled steroids, some long-acting beta agonists, some derifalin-like salts, some montedeocast, some nebulization is going on, and off and on the child is taking steroids as well. So the clinical situation is, 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 is really confusing, and this is the, the, the situation of the doctor who is, who is sitting across, and he, he actually doesn't clearly know what is to be done. So today we will talk about one such child who presented to us. So with that child, we will we'll just see how a child would present and how do you tease out the history, the clinical examination and go on to a diagnosis and a certain why this child is not improving. What is to be done regarding this child? And then we will go on to some, some cases which will help us to understand that all that wheezes may not be asthma. And then, and then at the end, we will summarize a, a bit of literature and then end with some conclusions. So let's go across with this, with this child who presented to us last year. So this is Miss Rim Jim, uh, who is nine years old girl and who has been referred to us for her non-improvement in asthma symptoms. So if we look at the, the clinical history in short, she's a nine years old girl. She was well till approximately three years of age. And then she started having episodes of cough, which usually started after a cold and which went to the chest. Now, initially these episodes were three or four times a year. The child used to improve with nebulization and some oral medicines. But now since 2017, so for the past two years, the number of episodes have been increasing. So instead of three or four episodes a year, the child started having increased number of episodes. So six to eight episodes a year. And correctly, the child was started on inhaled, uh, inhaled steroids with butacinide 400 microgram total dose. Now, since January, the, the number of episodes have increased further. So three or four episodes since January, which have been requiring oral steroids. So despite this child being on inhaled steroids, this child doesn't seem to be doing well. And when you examine this child, the child is otherwise well, the heart rates are normal, the respiratory rates are normal, and the child is wheezy. So what is to be done in this situation, right? So this is not uncommon, a child presenting to you with, an as with, with, a, with a history which is suggestive of possibly an asthma, and the child is on, you know, is on a lot of drugs, but the child doesn't seem to respond. So what are we going to do about it? Right. So let's go across and, and, and evaluate this child in a bit of detail. So what I would like to know further. So I would like to, you know, describe one episode in detail. So I would definitely like to tell them that is the, is the cough productive or wet cough? Or is it, a, is it a dry cough? Because sometimes you can be dealing with the bronchiectasis. How does it begin with? Is it always virus-induced episodes or even without a viral infection, the child starts to wheeze and cough? How many days the episode usually lasts? And what medicines are required to abort the episode? So 
So once we ask the mother, you know, the episodes are usually dry, but sometimes they are wet during the course. Initially, it starts with a cold, but now even without cold, she has episodes. Right? They used to last for five to seven days, but now they're getting prolonged. So they, they, they might be lasting for 10 to 15 days. And, and, and these things are all important because if, if you're dealing with asthma episodes, then, then prolonged episode, prolonged cough is something which, would, which, which makes you feel that this child possibly has asthma. And, and the child requires nebularization with steroid syrups as well. So that tells you the gravity of situations. Now, what else would I like to know? So I would like to know the, the information on severity of the episodes, right? So how many times the child has been uh, required to go to the emergency in the hospital? Has the child ever been admitted in, in the hospital? Has she ever been admitted to the PIC? So when we ask the mother, she has required one or two ER visits in a year. She gets breathless and has to be taken to the emergency in the night. She has been admitted once three years back, that was in the ward. But last year she had a bad episode and she required an ICU admission. Now, we would like to know about seasonal variation because that is again typical of, an, of, of a bronchial asthma. And we would also like to know about what's happening towards severity. Is it, is it increasing? Is it the same? Or is it becoming better? That will help us to decide the treatment which we want. So, Yes, there was seasonal. She used to be better in, 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 the, in the peak summer in the winters, but now irrespective of season, Rim Jim has episodes and then the mother feels that for the past one and a half years, the severity is, is getting up. So what else we would like to know? We would now like to see that what's happening to Rim Jim in the past few months. Right? So we have got a broad clinical picture that we know that, yes, she is possibly an asthma. Uh, she started at three years of age. For the past six years, she has been having symptoms, often on ER visits, one ICU admission, one ward admission. But what has been happening to her daily life? So how many days a week on average she gets symptoms of cough and breathlessness? How many nights she's not doing well? And does the asthma interfere with her exercise? So once we deal with, with these questions, we found out that she has daily symptoms now. The cough persists and increases with exercise. She used to play basketball, but she gets breathless now and she has stopped that. And twice a week, she has nighttime symptoms as well. So that tells us that she has possibly an asthma and this asthma is definitely poorly controlled. So as you know that there are two domains of asthma control, one is the current impairment and the other is the domain of risk. So she has definitely a lot of impairment in the current functioning. Right, now, in addition to the asthma symptoms, we would like to know about the comorbid conditions which the child might be having in association with the asthma. So we would like to know about the recurrent sneezing, nasal block, block nose and itchy nose, and how many hours per day the symptoms are troublesome and does it affect the daily activity? So yes, she's having nasal symptoms for the past four to six months, almost daily symptoms and three to four hours a day, she's not feeling as good. She's sneezing, especially in the morning. She's having a block nose, but not a runny nose. And she also complains of something going down the throat and increasing her cough. And that is possibly suggestive of a post-nasal trip. We also like to know about the mouth breathing, which tells us about the adenoids, any snoring, difficulty in sleeping. So we are looking at sleep apneas and any problems with speech and hearing, which can be associated with an adenoid hypertrophy, which we are trying to look at. So she had none of these problems. You would also like to know about what triggers or asthma when even smokes in the family, any, any irritants present in the, in the environment like DOs, perfumes, talcs, are they using even any smokes smoke in the family, coils, any, any irritants, and does she play in a dirty and a dusty environment? So yes, father occasionally smokes, she is fond of DOs, perfumes, but they're not sure about the school environment. And then we would definitely like to know about the medicines which she is using and how is she using. 
So very important question is in Ehlers. So when were they started? Who gives it? How often do you think the doses are missed? Are you using a spacer in, a, in, in, in association with your, space, with your inhaler? How do you take it? And at the end, do you know what are the benefits of inhalational therapy? So she was started on inhalers last year when she got into the PICU. She is usually supervised by the mother, but now she feels that she's well-trained and Rimjim is nine years and she can take the inhalers herself. Uh, how many doses are missed? Well, 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 doctor, I'm not sure. She might be missing a few, but the mother is not supervising, so she's not very sure. And can't I, can't she use a inhaler without a spacer, doctor? I have seen it uh, in a lot of television serials and films. She's quite grown up. What is the use of the spacer? And when we asked her that, do you know about the benefits of inhalational therapy? Well, uh, doctor, we were asked to use inhalers. You know, uh, we were told they're good, but, um, and she pauses and says that, you know, they can be addictive, you know, that they have steroids. And, and my doctor who started said that they have to be taken at least for a year or even longer. And uh, doctor, do you think it, it cures her asthma? So once you dig deeper into the history, you realize that there are lots of things going on which you may not have realized which are, which are on. So although she has been started on inhalers, there are a lot of apprehensions in the mind of parents, right? Mm -hmm. And that can be one of the reasons why this child doesn't seem to improve. So let's go ahead and see what, what's happening to Rimjin. So when you examine her, her weight is fine. She's well built, her height is okay. She has no other significant findings, no atopic features. Her chest seems to be normal in shape and she has a bilateral polyphonic wheezing. And you examine the other systems in detail. So the, the cardiovascular, the abdomen and the CNS seems to be within normal limits. Now, it's a part of our examination that we would always ask parents to show how you are taking your inhalers. And um, let's see, can we improve it? We might be able to do that. So uh, I, can't take, I can't take it well, doctor. There are no issues. You know, I've been trained well. So that's the usual question the parents, this is the usual answer which parents will give you. But, you know, uh, we are also a bit adamant in all these things. So. We always tell them, okay, let's see. We might be able to improve it. And once she was taking her inhaler, you know, the, the canister was empty. She did not exhale well. She did not inhale well once she had actuated the inhaler and she did not hold her breath well. So we, we realized that there are lots of problems with her technique. And that might be a reason why Jim Jim is not improving. So let's summarize Rimjim here before we go on. So, so what we are thinking about is that what is the possible diagnosis? Are we all sure it is asthma and it is nothing else? So do we have a possible differential diagnosis? How would you classify her control? Do you think this is partially controlled, well controlled or poorly controlled? Does she have any comorbid conditions? And has the family received adequate asthma education so do they know about the disease? Do they know about diagnosis? Do they know about the dose of the drug to be given? How it is to be given? What are the delivery issues? And do they know about trigger and allergen avoidance? So we went ahead and investigated Rimjim. And the most important investigation in such scenarios would be to do a lung function test. And this is a typical spirometry trace which you would find in a child with asthma. Now, if you look at this graph carefully, then you, you can find two curves, the blue one and the red one. So the blue one is the pre-bronchodilator curve and the red one is the post-bronchodilator curve after we have given 400 micrograms of salbutamol. So if you look at this graph, then this graph appears to be slightly smaller in size. And if you look at the shape of the curve, then this part of the curve appears to be more of scooped. So it shows a lot of scooping 
which tells us that this curve has obstruction. And the post bronchodilator curve, which is much better in shape and size, and this scooping has gone. And if we look at the values, then look at the FEV1s and the FVCs, and you can see that the FEV1 by FVCs are low. The FEV1 by FVC ratios are reduced, suggesting of obstruction. And once you repeat them, after giving a bronchodilator, then you can find a significant reversibility in the FEV1s. So it, it suggests a reversible airflow obstruction, and that is consistent with the diagnosis of asthma in this particular child. So finally, with regard to rim gym, we can conclude that she has an asthma, there's no doubt about it. We have a lung function which shows obstruction, which shows reversibility. She has comorbid conditions in the form of allergic rhinosinusitis. And let's identify the reasons why she is not well. So reasons of poor control could be poor adherence, improper technique, allergens which have not been taken care of, comorbid conditions like allergic rhinosinusitis, and she might be getting an inadequate drug doses and we might consider doing a step up of treatment. So the family was given education regarding the diagnosis of asthma, the need for inhalation therapy and the devices which are available. We reinforced the need for adherence to medicines. We demonstrated and checked the technique and did a trigger avoidance. So we added intranasal steroids for the comorbid allergic rhinitis. And at this moment, we added LABA to the inhaled corticosteroids to make her better. And in addition, all children with asthma, especially if they have ER visits or if they, if they have admissions, they would need an asthma action plan. So ideally all patients would need, and this asthma action plan has a green zone, yellow zone, as, and as a red zone. The green zone is doing well, and they need to continue their medicines regularly, even if they are well. The yellow zone is when the asthma is getting a bit worse, so what they are going to do about it. And the red zone is a medical alert, then what, what are they going to do about it? Give a dose of prednisolone, uh, give bronchodilator every 20 minutes for three times, and rush to a hospital. And these are asthma actions plan which are available everywhere and this is something which we use in our clinic in our hospital. So uh, once you have decided on what step of treatment you are going to put the child on, you can step up or step down and this is the latest GINA table uh, for 6 to 11 years of age children. So you have step 1 to step 5. So step 1 could be either no treatment or SOS, short-acting beta agonist, but sometimes people advocate that low-dose inhaled steroid should be added. Step two is daily low-dose inhaled corticosteroids. The options, the alternate options, but not as good options could be Montelukast. Step three is low-dose steroids with LABA or medium-dose steroids. Step four would be a medium-dose steroid with LABA and might need an expert advice. And step five is a poorly controlled child on these steps of treatment, which requires expert opinion, and you might be dealing with a severe asthma. So these are the steps which we have talked about. Now for older children more than 12 years of age, uh, the steps are a bit similar. Uh, the only difference is that at step one, we have good data to suggest that SOS ICS for metrol can be used or low dose ICS with SABA can be used. So that is the new GINA change which has happened and the rest of the steps remain nearly the same. Now what happened to RIMGIN? So we were looking at improvement in symptoms, breakthrough symptoms, rescue SABA, sleep disturbance, school absentism, what happened to a physical activity, the satisfaction of the family regarding treatment, the compliance and the technique. So she had good improvement in her, sim in her symptoms. There were no breakthrough symptoms. Uh, she did not require SABA. There was no sleep disturbance. She was going to school properly. She could 
play and they were quite satisfied taking their treatment properly and the technique was good so after three months she was shifted to plain corticosteroids so if you remember we had added laba so we had stepped down after three months uh, and then after six months she was shifted to low, low dose in aid corticosteroids so which was again a step down from the medium dose which she was on and she was also given an asthma action plan now just a small word regarding children who are under 5 uh, so we know that you can have a mixed bag here you can have few children who have asthma who few children who do not have asthma so gina has given a very easy symptom based approach which which tells you about the probability of a particular child having asthma so on your left you have symptoms like short duration uri followed by a wheeze a few episodes in a year like two or three in a year and no symptoms between episodes so very few of them will have asthma now as the the duration of episodes increases more than 10 days of for each episode more than three episodes in a year severe episodes and even in between episodes the child keeps having symptoms then the chances of asthma increases and some will have asthma now as you go on to the right side as you can see the symptoms are longer the number of episodes are more than 3 a year in between episodes the child still has cough wheeze heavy breathing and in addition they have allergen sensitization seen by a skin prick test atopic dermatitis food allergy or family history of asthma so they have given a lot of weightage to the family history and an atopic background for a particular child and in such situations most children will have asthma you can do a lung function in young children as well so this is something uh, which is now used for long times uh, and available even in india so this is an equipment which is called as an impulse oscillometer so this is a loudspeaker which produces sound voice Uh, sound waves these go across here to the pneumotac and the child is holding on to this mouthpiece and breathing and the and the breathing of this child gets superimposed on the sound waves and in in totality it is picked up with the pneumotac and you get your results so it will give you something different than the traditional spirometries which we are looking at so it gives you resistance and it gives you reactants and there would be a lot of children where we would find that the spirometries are normal so for example this is a 6 years old child who had suspected asthma frequent symptoms required nebulization but spirometries are normal but when we investigated this child further we found that the impulse oscillometries shows significant obstruction and reversibility so these are the r5 or the resistance at 5 hertz which is significantly increased the normal value is around 100 and once you give bronchodilators to this child it improves significantly so there is a 42% change in the r5 values post bronchodilators which tells us that this child definitely has obstruction and reversibility even when the child had a normal spirometry so it is actually something what is known as or described as small airway dysfunction in children with asthma now children have uh, or younger children have uh, again a step ladder from gina so it goes from step 1 which is an infrequent wheezer and no interval symptoms only sos treatment is required now as you go on to step 2 so the the symptom pattern is more consistent with asthma so as if you remember the 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 table which i had shown symptoms are is in the middle one or the right side and asthma symptom doesn't seem to be well controlled or the child does not fall into a, a symptom pattern which is consistent with asthma but the child keeps on having frequent episodes of wheeze so child has one episode in september then october then november and december so even if this child appears to be like an 
like a volary, this child deserves prophylaxis to improve the quality of life. And hence, this child should be on step two, which is daily low-dose inhaled corticosteroids. Now, if this child doesn't seem to be doing well, and you do not have any alternate differential diagnosis, then you might switch on to step three, which is doubling the low-dose inhaled corticosteroids. If you have started something like 100 microgram of butacinide air, you can shift this child to 200 microgram of butacinide. And even if this child is still not improving, then you go on to the step four, which requires an expert opinion to rule out alternate differential diagnosis and see why this child is not getting better. Now, once you have done all these things and you, you have followed up RIMGEM for, for a longer period of time, for approximately six months to a year, you'll be able to classify her severity. So now the classification of severity is not based on the current symptoms, rather they are based on the amount of medicine which is needed to give them a good control. So if a child needs low-dose inhaled corticosteroids for a good control, then despite the frequency or severity of symptoms, the child would be classified as mild. So as you can see, Rimjim had very bad symptoms initially, but finally Rimjim could go on to low dose inhaled corticosteroids and was remaining well. So even if the presentation tells us that she might need a higher dose, she has settled down at a low dose inhaled corticosteroid and we would still label it as a mild form of persistent asthma. Now let's come to the core topic that when do you label a child as problematic severe asthma? So any school aged child who requires at least 800 mic microgram of inhaled corticosteroids, which is butacinide equivalent, and has undergone a trial of at least two of the three additional controllers. So 800 micrograms of inhaled corticosteroids. And in addition, the child requires or has undergone a trial of two or three controllers in addition so that is LABA, so that's your formatrol or salmitrol, has, has got a, a trial with LTRAs, that is your Montelukast, and oral theophylline, and still has symptoms, right? And these symptoms would fall in either of these categories. So persistent chronic symptoms with a poor quality of life. So daily cough, daily bees, daily breathlessness. Acute severe exacerbations with or without associated interval symptoms. So you've given high uh, moderate dose inhaled corticosteroid plus LABA plus Montelukast, and still the child gets four or five exacerbations a year. In one of these exacerbations, the child is admitted and might get admitted to an ICU. So this child is not doing well. Then persistent airflow obstruction following a steroid trial. So you've given steroids, the child responds, but on the lung function, the child shows a persistent obstruction or the child needs alternate daily doses of steroids or alternate days of steroids. So these are the scenarios when you would consider this particular child as a problematic severe asthma. Now this problematic severe asthma includes four types of children, right? So one could be it is actually not an asthma. So you're not dealing with asthma, but an alternate differential diagnosis and we are going to talk about it in the next slides. So not asthma at all. The other could be that the child has an asthma plus, which means the additional comorbid conditions, which is not letting the asthma settle down, right? As Rimjim had. The third could be that it is difficult to treat why it is difficult to treat because she is not getting proper treatment, right? And the fourth, which is the most uncommon of all these would be a true therapy resistant asthma. And even this term is changing because therapy resistant asthma, now you have a lot of therapies for resistant asthma. So even this term is now going to fade off. And usually you have a combination of an asthma plus and a difficult to treat situation because of the compliance, adherence, and the technique related issues. That is what Rimjim had. 
Now let's go on to, to what we were talking on here that not asthma at all. So you have a list of differential diagnosis or atypical wheezers or mimickers which can present with similar symptoms but they are actually not asthma. So they could be things like infections which can be recurrent LRTIs, bacterial bronchitis, suppurative lung disease and bronchiectasis. So this is one group of condition which can present with these symptoms. You can have symptoms of tuberculosis, you can have chronic rhinitis, sinusitis, adenoid hypertrophy, and a bronchiolitis obliterans. So these are conditions which can present with uh, V's, but they're actually not asthma. Then you can have congenital problems like tracheomalacia, bronchomalacia. You can have things like cystic fibrosis, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, ciliary dyskinesias. And you can have things like immune deficiency, which can present like this. Then airway compressions because of vascular or non-vascular airway compressions. H type of tracheoesophageal fistula. So congenital problems are definitely on, and especially in young children, they are quite important. And then we can have mechanical problems like gastroesophageal reflux disease or the GERD and foreign body aspiration. And believe me, we do see all of these things in clinical practice. So each and every diagnosis we have seen a multiple times. So be careful about atypical visas or mimickers. We do understand that it is a long list of differential diagnoses. It's not easy to take them on, right? But at least we should know how to you know, pick up that odd man out, out of those 50 patients which you might be seeing a day. So I'll just give you two examples showing two clinical cases. So this is an old case of ours, a 12 years old boy who presented to the ENT department. Why ENT department? Because this child had a chronic nasal obstruction and nasal discharge for the past three or four years. On examination, had a nasal turbinate hypertrophy with a nasal discharge. So the ENTs got a CT and the CT was showing a lot of sinusitis. So pan sinusitis involving the maxillary sinuses and the other sinuses as well. So it was a pan sinusitis and the child doesn't seem to be improving. So they had planned this child for a functional endoscopic, uh, functional endoscopic sinus surgery. So how did we get into the picture? So when this child went to anesthesia for a pre-anesthetic checkup, they found this child has been wheezing. So this child was referred to pediatrics. So once we reviewed the history, uh, there was a persistent nasal discharge, there was nasal obstruction, and there was a chronic cough and possibly a chronic wet cough. Now this child did not have any severe exacerbations, aerolagen sensitization, atopic dermatitis, any GRD symptoms, and no family history of ADOP or asthma. So similar ENT findings, nothing else we could find. There was a bilateral polyphonic wheezing. So we also kept the diagnosis as asthma with rhinosinusitis. But this child was, wasn't improving with the asthma treatment which we had given, but why? So we had done a lung function. Again, you can see lung function shows a mild obstruction, scooping of the curve, low FEV1 by FVC values, and but no significant reversibility. So that's a bit fishy, but we thought let's treat it as asthma and let's see. And this child has three x-rays. So have a good look at these x-rays and what do you think these x-rays are telling us? So a bit of hyperinflation in all these x-rays, they appear slightly more black. And this diaphragm seems to be flattened on both sides. Anything else? Well, we missed a lot of things in this x-ray and that is what we had missed. So if you look at these x-rays carefully, then the marker was actually on the wrong side. It should be on the right side. So this child, actually had dextrocardia, which we had missed. And dextrocardia with all these symptoms 
or a situs inversus with all these symptoms point towards the diagnosis of a primary ciliary dyskinesia or Cartagnard syndrome. So this was an asthma mimicker which we had seen. So be careful about things. They, they do come our way. Now, you can have situations like this as well. So this is a young child who is around six years of age, six months of age. And this child has been having noisy breathing for the past six, past six months. So since birth, the child has not been well uh, and has been on nebulization on most days of the month, but no response, no hospital admissions. Something different going on, noisy breathing since birth, no response to nebulization. So let's see this video and I hope I can play it for you. Okay. So look at the respiratory image. Okay, so uh, this child has a noisy breathing and this is possibly since birth. So we are possibly dealing with some congenital issue uh, which has been masquerading as asthma. And if you look at this child carefully, then otherwise the child is well, but the child has some expiratory noise, fine. So noisy breathing could be in the form of a strider, which is something like, <gasps> So it is not like that. It is an expiratory sound like this. So this is a, a typical expiratory wheezing or a monophonic wheezing which was heard. So we were possibly dealing with some tracheal issue. So we went ahead and we thought that this child possibly requires a bronchoscopy to look at tracheal compressions. And I'll just play this, this video for you. So this is the flexible bronchoscopy, which we did. And as you can see, this is the anterior tracheal wall. This is the posterior tracheal wall. And in between, you find that the trachea is actually collapsing. So hardly any space can be seen here. And as I go down, you'll be able to see the carina and, and the trachea. So you can see the posterior tracheal wall, the anterior tracheal wall is, is almost approximating and you can't find any space here. Now, as we are going down towards the, the, the carina, we'll be able to visualize the bronchus. So you can see the left main bronchus here. You can see a left main bronchus here, but you still can't see a right main bronchus because of the tracheal compression, which is, which is more on the right side. And as I go down, you can now see the right main bronchus and the left main bronchus. So right main bronchus, well seen, no compression here, right intermediate bronchus and the right upper lobe bronchus. And as I turn to the left side, the left, the left bronchus also appears to be normal. So it is a tracheal compression, which is not varying with the respiration, which is not dynamic. What are the causes? So the usual cause in this age group is a vascular airway compression. So we did a CT angiography. And what we find here is that this is the right aortic arch and this is the left aortic arch. So it is a double aortic arch and in between the two arches you have the trachea and the esophagus which are compressed. And most of these children will have some symptoms associated, uh, some esophageal symptoms associated. So usually they would have some amount of dysphagia in between. So be careful about congenital lesions. Right, so let's go on and, and see the theoretical background regarding these. So if you have a child who presents to you with a difficult asthma, 
the step one is to confirm a diagnosis and, and, and look at differential diagnosis, which we have just talked about. Then you look at the contributing factors to symptoms, exacerbation, and poor quality of life. So you have to go back and drill down the whole history and examination again and again and see what we are missing at. And then you try to optimize treatment. You optimize the technique, deal, at, deal adherent issues, treat, treat, more, uh, treat the comorbid conditions, and you might need to step up treatment as we had done for tension. Right? So once the child presents with this, you have to go from step one to step three. Now, once you have done this, you debut the child in your clinic for the next three to six months and assess the response. And after doing all this, if the child is still not well, then you can label this child as a severe asthma or a therapy resistant asthma. So any child who presents to you today cannot be labeled as a therapy resistant asthma or a severe asthma. You have to follow this child up for the next few months. Look at all the things which we have talked about in the presentation today. And after three to six months of treatment, you would be in a position to, to clearly say whether this child responds to the therapy or not, despite these adequate steps. So if this child is not responding now, now you have to phenotype these, this child to the side treatment. So we need an FENO or an exhaled nitric oxide, blood and sputum eosinophil, skin prick test or an immunocap to look at what's going on. Is it an IgE mediated asthma or not? Now, as you go on and assess this child, we have to look at type two inflammation or the eosinophilic inflammation. So how do you judge that? So blood eosinophil is one marker. Uh, you can have an FEN of more than 20 or sputum eosinophils of more than 2% or asthma you find is clinically allergen driven. So these are the indicators which tells you that the, it is a type 2 inflammation or an eosinophilic type of asthma which you are dealing with. So now you can divide your children with severe asthma into two groups, eosinophilic and non-eosinophilic. So even at this step or or what is known as a step 6a, we are still going to optimize treatment. Look at adherence again, because there would be a lot of patients who despite being severe are not adherent to treatment and you can use smart inhalers. And one of the devices is now available even in India. So these smart inhalers can trace each and every dose which has been taken by the patient in a digital form. Try high dose nailed corticosteroid for three to six months. Consider using tyotropium, and we're just going to talk about tyotropium in the next slide. Consider a possibility of GRD, bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, rhinosinusitis, and treat an atopic dermatitis if, if it is there. Now in non-eosinophilic patients, the rest of the things remain the same. You might try macrolides. And if the child is actually behaving like non-eosinophilic, then you should be more digging into the differential diagnosis and considering a CT chest a bronchoscopy induced sputum because you might be dealing with a bronchiectasis and hence this child is not showing the correct phenotype. Now, tyotropium is basically an anticholinergic drugs which can be used for children more than six years of age and adults with poorly controlled asthma and it is currently an option for step four and step five of GINA. And there have been long, large randomized control trial with childhood difficult to treat asthma. And it has been a good add-on. It improves lung function. It decreases the risk of exacerbation and slows the worsening of disease. And we have some amount of data in one to five years as well. But in less than six years of age, it is still an off-label use. How does tyotropium act? So, uh, the mechanism of action appears to be complex, but it has it has to deal with modulation of bronchomotor tone, inhibition of smooth muscle remodeling, inhibition of TH2 cytokine release, emission, uh, inhibition of chemotactic mediators, eosinophilic recruitment, modulation of coplet cells, increase in cough threshold. So you can read about tyotropium if you if you feel you are interested in this. And these are the key trials which are there. I'm not going into details because of the paucity of time. 
and we have meta analysis also which are published so in 2017 we have meta analysis of of tyrotropium in school age children and we have safety data in children 1 to 5 years as well so once you're done with 6a you have classified your child and still the child doesn't seem to respond it it breaks into two arms the first would be that can the family afford or do they have an access to biological treatments so that is your malizumab and rest of the drugs so that is the anti ig and we'll just going to talk about it or that is not available not possible then you can optimize again and see whether you can add on a laba tyrotropium or put this child on a low dose oral corticosteroids on alternate days to maintain this child now the step 6b is basically for biologicals so what what do we have which is available to us so omalizumab has been there for the past many years you need to have a, a perennial allergen sensitization before you embark on omalizumab uh it has to have that ige range in the weight range and a specified number of exacerbation in the last year only then omalizumab can be used then you have something new which is available which is known as an anti il5 uh, antagonist which is known as mepolizumab which is now available in india and european agencies have cleared it for more than 6 years of age it can be used for neosinophilic asthma and we also have dupulimab which is also approved which is an anti il4 r antagonist now again you can titrate your response if it is a good response you reevaluate gradually reduce the number of drugs but keep the child still on inhaled corticosteroids after a period of a, of a few months or year try and withdraw the biologicals and maintain this child on low dose inhaled corticosteroids for poor response the options are not very good some people are still considering bronchial thermoplasty but we do not have data as of now in especially for children so let's conclude with our take home messages that most children with difficult to treat asthma are due to a combination of faulty basic steps and comorbid conditions as we have seen a systematic approach will help to sort out most of these children do remember that all that wheezes is not asthma you still need to look at the differential diagnosis so am i sure this child has asthma is it nothing else which is going on and a small number of children have truly a severe asthma and they require an expert opinion so when do we need to refer a particular child with asthma to an expert so three conditions if you find a difficulty in confirming the diagnosis so if you feel it is a suppurative lung disease cystic fibrosis celiac dyskinesia or tropical pulmonary eosinophilias but you are not sure about it you want to further investigation even unclear diagnosis after a trial of inhaled corticosteroid so if given inhaled steroid but this child doesn't respond now you feel that you might be dealing with alternate diagnosis it can be a vocal cord dysfunction or something else which is going on then a persistent uncontrolled asthma or frequent exacerbations so this child doesn't maintain well at step 4 of treatment and you have sorted out rest of the issues like technique compliance adherence and so on and this child reserves a referral and this child if has risk factors for asthma related deaths so near fatal asthma or pico admission or ventilation so these are the indications of referring a child to a expert so we end by just by enumerating what services we provide at our hospital and at our clinic <clears throat> so we are providing bronchoscopies for all ages we do bronchoscopic extraction of foreign bodies with the flexible scope lung functions including uh, oscillometries for young children sweat chlorides video fluoroscopic swallows then allergy testing and sleep studies so i end here uh, my talk and i would hand over to dr abbas and he would coordinate with 
all the questions and i'll be happy to take any questions if they are yeah. thank you very much sir uh, for your uh, excellent deliberation uh, there are uh, uh, many questions uh, we have received almost 178 responses uh, from across country and uh, sir uh, the questions are um, majority of the doctors are uh, many doctors are asking on uh, treatment with inhalers in uh, uh, children which are uh, below 18 months or below 16 months they want to know when they are initiating the steroids uh, which inhaled steroid they should use and how they should use and uh, how they should taper off right so i think that's a very good question and preschool v is 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 a, uh, is, a, is a is a big topic so i had not touched upon a lot of things right so uh, i'll just go back to the slide which i had shown you and that will help us to understand the question but it is a it is a very relevant question so so once you have an under 5 child uh look at the pattern of the presenting illness is it more like just an episodic viral wheezing so which means the child just has a viral infection and wheezes and these are multiple episodes are we talking about this so this will be more common in young children who are less than 2 years or 3 years of age and after 3 years of age you will have more of child who presents to us in 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 this group on the right side or in the middle one and they are more like an asthma phenotype now in both these situations controllers or preventers might be required and if you look at this gina step ladder then it writes here if the symptom pattern is consistent with asthma and asthma symptoms are not controlled or has more than 3 exacerbations are here the child deserves inhaled corticosteroids right the other quite the other situation could be that you have a young child who presents with symptoms which are not consistent with asthma which means you feel it is more like a volary or what is called as an episodic viral wheeze which simply means the child gets a viral infection and wheezes remains well but again has the same thing so recurrent viral induced episodes if they are uh, if they are affecting the quality of life of a child requiring oral steroids requiring hospital admissions then even this group of children deserves inhaled corticosteroids and it says give a diagnostic trial for 3 months right so that's the first thing that both groups might require inhaled steroids there is no lower limit when you can use inhaled steroids as preventers but be careful that the younger the child and the more severe the symptoms you might be dealing with mimickers and always consider alternate differential diagnosis which have been listed here so in older children it is you are relatively confident they are behaving like asthma but if in young children if they are having a lot of episodes severe episodes requiring hospital admissions especially in children who are younger than 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 an year consider alternate differential diagnosis now if you are relatively sure you are not dealing with any alternate differential diagnosis then yes you should go ahead and try inhaled corticosteroids so either you use 50 micrograms of fluticasone twice a day or you use 100 micrograms of betacinide twice a day and you give it for a period of 3 months and see what the child happens okay thank you sir but once they have started it sir the, how they should taper off or they should continue that's what is uh, they want to know so in general the recommendation is that you use it for a period of 3 months and stop it even if the child has a good response because it can just be an interval effect and a lot of children with virus induced wheezes are improving spontaneously so you should not continue beyond a period of 3 months now in in situations where the child would have repeated episodes even after you have stopped inhaled steroids you should restart them and if the second time as well they have a good response to treatment then you are definitely justified to continue it for a longer time so what i would do is that in such situations i would give it at least for the winters stop it possibly for the summers but if the child has a typical asthma phenotype then they have to be continued on inhaled steroids for a longer term okay 
thank you sir uh, dr javed he wants to know uh, is there any role of immuno boosters like uh, bo- bovine colostrum and zinc in patient who does not respond to treatment uh, so the one answer is no there is no role perfect uh, sir uh, we have spoken about uh, comorbid conditions uh, wherein uh, there is present of uh, presence of allergic rhinitis and Uh, literature says to the tune of 18 to 38 percent of the patient may suffer from allergic rhinitis and asthma together. So um, uh, there are many questions. On, there are a couple of questions on uh, using uh, montelukast and uh, antihistamine combination. Okay. Uh, can it? Uh, does it have a role? And how long it can be used? So uh, montelukast. We have to understand that montelukast. as far as respiratory problem goes the role of montelukast in treatment for allergic rhinitis uh, it is lower uh, in rank as compared to nasal corticosteroids and oral or intranasal antihistamines right so it ranks third the other is for wheezing if you have a child who presents to you with a recurrent wheeze even there are meta analysis and uh, we had written in indian pediatrics as well that they are not a good option right yes you if you have a child who has some some wheezy episodes and you want to start with montelukast then that's okay uh, but you have to tell parents that inhaled steroids are a much better option right so that's one second is that the combination of montelukast with levocetirizine which is commonly available uh does not appear to be very rational to me for the reason being that if you're using a combination of montelukast with levocetirizine for allergic rhinitis it means that the rhinitis is has is at least moderate or severe and in such situations using nasal corticosteroids is much better so using montelukast with levocetirizine actually does not serve any purpose the other problem is that montelukast and levocetirizine it is difficult to combine as a single tablet or in a syrup form because one of them gets absorbed in uh, the acidic media and the other gets absorbed in the alkaline media so unless until you have a bilayer tablet which most companies don't it is not a very good option to use but to my to my knowledge and with my clinical experience i would say that do not use a combination it's not worth it try and use nasal corticosteroids or inhaled corticosteroid that will give you a much better clinical benefit as compared to this combination perfect sir uh, sir uh, there is one more question which says that uh, in case patient is uh, reluctant for uh, intranasal or uh, inhalation uh, medicine uh, how we uh, convince them and what are the if patient is not getting convinced what are the options available see um this is this is not a very easy question to answer because it requires it, it is not just the medical thing it is to involve a lot of emotions and family concepts and myths so what i usually do in my practice is see actually my practice is totally a referral respiratory practice so once parents are with me they can refer to me Uh, they have been across a lot of pediatricians and they are easy to convince uh in general what i would advise everyone is one that if everyone is on the same page and if everyone says that this is the best form of therapy then it solves a lot of issues so that's one second is that give time to them in the in the first consultation give them 15 20 minutes explain to them about disease and explain them about what is the best form of therapy and try and dispel myths now i do understand that there would be a few patients parents who would still not agree to what you say so i usually with time uh, and age i have been now believing that there is no sense of forcing anyone to do anything because they will not do it right so what i do is that i tell them that see there are options which are available as preventers 
if you wish that your child is put on preventers which is definitely going to improve the quality of life of not just you or not just the child but the whole family then you should consider about it now, most patient parents will agree that yes i want preventers i want my child to be well but lot of them will not agree that my child has to be on inhalers so what i would say is that see this is the best option if you are convinced about it let's start it now if you're not if you're not convinced about it let's put you on montelukast but believe me that the response to an inhaled steroid will not be as uh, the response to montelukast is never as good as an inhaled steroids and you can think about it and it is an open question and and don't get angry now what happens with time is that they will come back and follow up and then they will say doc sahab is not doing as good this ko to fir se ho gaya hai and and he is not improving and then i would say gently see uh, i told you last time also i feel that montelukast will not be as good i would prefer an inhaled steroids and most will agree so that is the way i do it you might have a different way of doing it always are correct but i think if you follow the scientific way the patient will be yours forever okay thank you sir sir uh, we would like to see you uh, on a screen live if you can really come in come in live that will be uh, better for us we will do the stop share yes sir please stop share and you will be visible on that yeah okay. perfect sir that's perfect uh, sir uh, uh, dr rajesh uh, uh, is asking uh, 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 only only night visors are there can we start uh, meter dose inhalers uh, long acting meter dose inhalers uh you have to be sure what you are dealing with when you are saying it is a night visor they do not have any symptoms in the day are you not dealing with any any other things so we have seen a lot of patients who present with vocal cord palsies they can present with adenoid hypertrophies uh you can have sleep apnea so be careful when we are talking about night time visor only <coughs> So that is something uh, which you have to be careful about. But yes, if you are dealing with a nighttime visa, even even low dose inhaled corticosteroids should be okay. But yes, in some situations, if you add LABA to it, then it gives a good and a sustained relief for 12 to 14 hours. And you can use a combination of inhaled steroids with long acting beta agonist, but you cannot use long acting beta agonist alone. Uh, sir, uh, there was question also on uh, use of LABA and SABA in younger age age group of patients. Uh, have we discussed this point, or would you like to revise it? Okay, so uh, that's a fair question. See, uh, SABA has no problem. So uh, salbutamol or levosalbutamol has been used across um, at all ages. So I don't think there is any problem. There have been some questions regarding uh, whether. Uh, beta 2 receptors are there in very young children or not uh, in general recurrent wheezing uh, starts after a few months of life so saba is not a problem laba has a problem that it is not fda approved so uh, formetrol and salmetrol you have 4 and 6 years of fda approval now why fda has not improved because they have not been uh, a lot of data which has been given to them Uh, on on uh, the efficacy and safety part, but clinical experience suggests that there would be a lot of children who are not well controlled on moderate dose inhaled corticosteroids and get absolutely well controlled when you use LABA. So it is an off-label use LABA which we do, and it is done across the globe. so if i have a child who presents to me with moderate grade symptoms not getting well controlled on 400 microgram per day night my lung function shows obstruction it shows reversibility and everything else has been taken care of then i would definitely put this child on laba and let me tell you that uh, i have a lot of patients who are on tiotropium so tiotropium is fda approved uh, for more than 6 years but what should i do of a child who just keeps on wheezing i don't have a differential diagnosis and keeps admitting in the hospital despite inhaled steroids and uh, using laba also so i have a lot of children between 1 and 5 on tiotropium i do understand my practice is more skewed because it is totally respiratory and totally referral based but it is an off label use so off label it can be used 
be careful about diagnosis differential diagnosis and good follow up okay thank you sir uh, dr Sh dr satish from bengaluru he is asking how frequently is a ge reflux seen in this group of children uh, great question so um, see g reflux is seen commonly now whether you are dealing with a gr or whether you are dealing with a gerd that is the most important question so in general you are not going to treat a gr you are going to treat only a gerd so how do you prove it is a gerd so the one question is when do you investigate so child having very severe symptoms especially present since birth and having repeated infiltrates in the x rays especially on dependent areas do evaluate them for grd uh, if there has been a quite a well period from birth till the onset of symptoms then the likelihood that this is grd is is quite unlikely there have been big trials which are published and i refer to one of the trials which was done in us and published in uh, the journal of american medical association or jama uh, and it says that in in they, they had done a randomized trial where they had used lansprazole in children with asthma who were poorly controlled they could find no benefit right this this pertains to older children even if they had done a ph or an impedance monitoring and shown that they had a reflux there was no significant clinical benefit so the use of um, any of these ppis should be reserved only if the child has additional either gi symptoms or it is a difficult to treat asthma and you have shown that this child has reflux only then i would treat it in an older child for a younger child it it is like an it is like an atypical visor or a mimicker not as asthma so it is a pure grd and i have said the situations would be a severe visor multiple admissions recurrent infiltrates dependent air in the dependent areas uh, requiring hospital admissions okay thank you sir dr anil uh, is asking Uh, he has a uh, typical uh, clinical situation where in seven year boy seven year boy is getting recurrent pneumonia every 30 days uh, he is he wants to know what may be the possible reason in this case uh, recurrent pneumonia as you can have multiple causes but if you have an older child who presents with consolidations uh, it depends on uh, the type so many things have to be seen i think think of immune deficiencies that would be one of the important causes um, but in general asthma can present as recurrent pneumonias uh, so you can have mucus plugging of the airways and lead to recurrent shadows you can have recurrent shadows but they are not true recurrent pneumonias uh, dr ranveer singh from ludhiana he he wants to know about treatment of pneumonia in asthmatic so uh, along with amoxicillin and clavulanic acid Uh, do we need to add uh, macrolides or any other antibiotics in the treatment the treatment of pneumonia in a child with asthma remains the same as a child with asthma the only thing which i would say is that a lot of children who have some infiltrates or asthma exacerbations do get unnecessary antibiotics that should not be done because most asthma exacerbations it has been shown that they are more viral induced not mycoplasma or bacterial pneumonia induced so we should reduce the amount of antibiotics but if you feel that this child has a typical pneumonia then treat it as a typical pneumonia and and continue your asthma management okay uh, dr rajesh is asking uh, your comment on sos use of uh, inhaled steroids so whenever we is there uh, child will use and then it will stop so what is your comment on that um so um uh, let's divide it into three age groups uh, less than 5 years 5 to 12 years and more than 12 years okay so in more than 12 years uh, there was a landmark trial so the o'brien's trial which was published uh, in the new england journal of medicine and what they had done was they had looked at mild asthmas so remember that we are talking about a mild asthma only we're not talking about moderate or a severe asthma 
So in mild asthma, what they had done was that they had used low-dose inhaled corticosteroids as preventers in one group. Uh, they had used SOS terbutaline in the second group and they had used SOS terbutaline, uh, or sorry, they had used um, ICS formatrol in the, in the third group and that was as a preventer. So what they found was that although the symptom control is best on low-dose bidacinide, the, the risk of having severe exacerbation in asthma deaths are significantly reduced if you add inhaled steroids to Saba or Laba. And that is the reason why Gina has changed the guideline that in step one, use SOS smart therapy. Now, we are not still very clear what is to be done for pediatrics, whether we, we, we agree to that or whether we wait for this because a lot of logistics involved. But definitely, Gina has come up with this statement. And if you look at the step ladder of Gina in more than 12 years, it is clearly there. Now, the data between 6 and 12 years for a mild asthma is still not there. It is just an extrapolated data with one or two trials. So what they say is that you can use either a combination of Saba with an inhaled steroid. Now, this combination is available only with one company. So Aeroquat is available, but we are not still not recommending this step. And the other option is to use an ICS formatrol combination uh, as a smart therapy. Uh, but as I said, you do not have a lot of data on this. Uh, but what Gina contemplates is that it will reduce the asthma-related deaths and exacerbations, severe exacerbations. Now, the data in children less than five, again, we do not have whatever trials were done on fluticasone, high dose. Uh, and most of the trials concluded that adding nebulized or inhaled corticosteroids during acute exacerbations do not help. So as of now, if we are talking about steroids for acute exacerbations, I would say no. I would say that if you need a steroid in less than five years, use an oral one. If you're using it as preventer, then use it with an inhaler and spacer and use it for at least three months. Thank you, sir, for your question, uh, for your answer. Now, Dr. Mrutinje uh, from Devanagari, he, want, uh, he wants to ask how to evaluate persistent nocturnal cough with no signs of bronchospasm. Uh, I think uh, the, the differential diagnosis remains limited and obviously you, you can be dealing with one or two things and uh, one would be an allergic rhinitis sinusitis. So allergic rhinosinusitis presents with a lot of post-nasal drip and they can have a bad cough at night uh, and no, no great cough in the day. So this is very well seen in practice and um, uh, if you do not find any V's in this clinical situation and it is a chronic issue, then I would definitely do a lung function to see because a lot of these patients can have a cuff variant asthma in association. But if your lung functions are also normal, uh, look at upper respiratory signs of allergic rhinitis, sinusitis and post-nasal drip and treat them. Uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Irfan from Srinagar, he's asking, what, uh, what might be the preferred mode of ventilation and optimal ventilator setting for a non-responding asthmatic patient landing into respiratory failure? So uh, I think they're usually on the volume mode and a low peep. Uh, that is what usually is, is followed uh, across the globe and along expiratory time. So I think that is the usual thing which is followed across. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, there, there is a question on nebulization. What is the role of magnesium sulfate uh, nebulization in asthma? Uh, and one more doctor has asked, uh, suppose if we do inhalation of uh, distilled water, uh, uh, will it help or uh, harm the patient? Distilled water, no. You never nebulize with uh, distilled water. It's only saline in any of these... Um, Respirator solutions, you never add distilled water, you add saline. 
regarding nebulization with magnesium sulfate uh, to the best of my knowledge it's only iv uh, the inhaled max sulf uh, trials were inconclusive for uh, bronchial asthma acute exacerbations thank you sir uh, dr rk srivastava from deoria he is asking he is sharing his experience he is saying that when i stop animal milk in my patient i have noticed that Uh, very mild or no attack in future uh, is there any study regarding relationship of animal milk and attack of asthma uh so you can have a cow's milk protein allergy which presents with respiratory symptoms as well so uh, so in general cow's milk protein allergy can have ige and non ige mediated reactions respiratory symptoms are seen only with ige mediated reactions and not seen with non ige that is totally gi so if you have an ige mediated reaction with cow's milk then usually within half an hour to 2 hours they will have an episode of cough and wheeze and in addition they can have things like urticaria they can have angioedema they can have anaphylaxis and they can have diarrhea now if you have all of these things which falls into clinical place then i would say that yes you're dealing with a cmpa which is ige mediated now if that is not the case uh, i do understand you, you you might have seen a benefit after not using uh, cow's milk but at the same time we might be treating with other drugs as well so Uh, what i would do in such situations is keep the child on inhaled steroids for a while the child is well and then start and see what happens with cow's milk if you still get a reaction with cow's milk then then yes you are you are you are pretty sure but as i said then they, they it has to be an ige mediated reaction not an non ige thank you sir uh, sir uh, there is one more question on uh, allergen testing or a skin prick testing in children below 5 years does it have any role and how if possible if yes how uh, we can do it so skin testing can be done at any age there is no there is no limit uh, you can use it it depends on why you want to use it and what allergens you want to use so younger the child the lesser the chances that they are going to be sensitized to aero allergens right so most people will not be testing aero allergens in children below 2 years of age if they are more than 2 years of age then you can test aero allergens although Uh, there is no contraindication in young children as well but in older children we test aero allergens so the typical aero allergens which are seen now in younger children uh, the the skin pick testing is mainly for diagnosis of food allergy which is your milk egg soy uh, uh, peanut tree nuts and and the fish right so it depends on what clinical situation you are using it for Uh, but it can be used in children less than 5 uh, years definitely and as i showed in my presentation aero allergen sensitization in a child is a very strong marker that this child is atopic and will go on to develop asthma if this child is having recurrent wheeze moreover if you have a child who is uh, having a persistent type of disease and this child is sensitized mainly to house dust mites which means uh, the the pteromyces and the farinaceae then there might be a situation that this child and if this child is not growing out of it after a few years then you can consider a supplemental immunotherapy as well thank you sir uh, sir there are few questions regarding covid 19 so with your permission we can take this question sir okay. yeah sir uh, dr riyas from srinagar he wants to know how we can differentiate between tachypnea bronchial asthma and uh, which is due to covid 19 um see uh, uh, the the theoretical answer would be that in general a known bronchial asthma presents with an exacerbation right uh, you're pretty sure it is an asthma right the child is not running uh, bad fever the child is not having bad infiltrates in the x ray so you are pretty certain that this child has asthma now no one knows whether a covid 19 can exacerbate an asthma we are not sure about it in children right but if you have a clinical situation where the child presents with high grade fever breathlessness and has a pneumonia on x ray 
in this scenario, you will not be able to rule out the COVID-19. Now, on the practical side, most hospitals, if they present, and this happened when we had an H1N1 as well, and I happened to run the H1N1 ward in, in when I was at Kalavati Saran Children's Hospital. So most children who present with an ILI, an influenza-like illness, in such pandemics would have to be screened for a COVID-19 if they are specially getting admitted. And they would be admitted to, a, to an area which takes suspect COVIDs and once they are turned negative, they would be shifted to the general wards. So you do not have very clear indicators, but you, you have relatively um, clarity on clinical situation. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, there is a question related to COVID-19 that there is a lot of anxiety. So what is the anxiety amongst the patients uh, about this COVID-19? What is the way you decrease the anxiety in these patients uh, who are co co COVID positive but uh, asymptomatic or uh, on the contrary, uh, they are asthmatic but even COVID negative? Uh, see, at the moment, if there is no clear history of travel uh, or a healthcare worker in the family, then uh, you are okay. Right? And uh, mild disease is not a problem so you have to finally uh, tell your patients parents to be to be calm unless until they have a history and most patients with covid-19 also improve so so that should be okay okay uh, uh, there are uh, there are a couple of uh, new questions which has come sir dr abdul from sitra he wants to know a uh, few words of a foreign body presenting as v's and its uh, clinical history so, uh, Dr. Bas, what's happening is that I'm not carrying the charger of this laptop. Oh. And it's going to die. Okay. Google. Okay. So, what I can do is that I can connect with my phone. Sure. And we can go on with the question. So, would you just give me two minutes? Interval? Yeah, sir. Uh, I think uh, this last question and uh, we will we will end the session. And remaining question, we can answer it. Uh, uh, we will take down these questions and we can reply them back. Okay, okay, okay. So, sorry. Can you can you repeat the question? Yeah, he wants to know about foreign body uh, presenting as a V's and its clinical history. So, uh, it's a very, very important thing which you should look at in a typical age group. Uh, we, we get to see a lot of foreign bodies in a particular season, which is the winter season. So, if you have a foreign body in the airway, uh, either the foreign body can be, can be in the trachea or in the bronchi. Now, if it is in the trachea, then you will have a monophonic wheeze for sure, or you'll have a strider, right? And your x-rays can be normal. So look at a history of choking, aspiration, a whale child before the episode, and then you get a wheeze, and then you have no response to treatment. Now, if you have a, a foreign body which is smaller, which gets lodged into either of the bronchi, then you will have some localizing signs. So either you will have a reduced air entry on, on one side and you might have on x-rays hyperinflation or a collapse. But let me tell you, even with bronchial foreign bodies, sometimes this ball valve is not happening and the x-rays get wrong. So reduced air entry is a very important sign which has to be picked up clinically. So in a child who has a wheeze, which doesn't seem to respond, has a history of choking, but you may not get a typical history. So if you have non-response to wheeze with your steroids and bronchodilators, in that particular age group, do think in terms of foreign body. And we, we, we take out a lot of foreign bodies with the flexible scope uh, in the winter, winter season who presents with persistent wheezing. Okay. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for your excellent deliberation and very informative talk. Uh, now, I request our business head, Mr. Sundar Rajan, to give a vote of thanks. Sir, over to you. Yeah. Respected doctors, good afternoon to you all. First of all, I thank all of you for being part of uh, Influence. Uh, the digital learning platform of Sun Pharma Stanley Division. My heartfelt gratitude 
to Dr. Ankit Parak for giving a wonderful case-based, lucid, and highly informative presentation on treating with difficult asthma cases. Thanks a lot, sir. It was a highly informative presentation, and we are very confident that this will be of great use to the pediatricians. My heart this from various parts of the country. We are very grateful. Our sincere thanks to all of you. And my thanks is also due to Dr. Komal Abba for coordinating this uh, live event. In a very thank you. good. Thank thanks you, a lot. And thank you very much. Good day. Thank you. I think we can end this session, Dr. Kumar. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot, uh, sir. Thank you, Dr. Bas. Thank yeah. you, sir. Thank you very it much, It was sir. excellent, sir. It was thank excellent. You. And so nice. Very informative. I really, I really appreciate your patience, sir. Uh, we asked so many questions. No, no. I, uh, I'm absolutely <laughs> okay with that. Uh, and what we'll do, sir, we'll try to make a fre uh, frequently asked question out of it. And sure. uh, yeah, we will share with you and then we will make it, uh, uh, we'll share, distribute it among the doctors. It will really help. Absolutely. You. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll be happy to do that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Thank you, Dr. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, sir. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.